like to to hand over to him as he will be taking us through the devotion. Over to you, Dr. Mberere. Thank you. Uh, good morning, my dear brothers and sisters in Christ. We want to thank the Lord for yet another session uh, that uh, the Lord has uh, given unto us. So uh, this morning, as we uh, come to the end of the this month's uh, Sunday session, I'll, I invite us to turn our attention to the book of um, Isaiah chapter 39. Isaiah 39. Um, in Isaiah, uh, in the previous chapters, the previous chapters were quite dramatic for King Hezekiah and uh, the whole nation of Judah. This was a very eventful, uh, you know, chapters beginning in chapter 36 of the book of um, Isaiah. Then chapter 37, we find there in those two chapters, one of the most dramatic events in the life and experience of the people of Judah. That is uh, the king of uh, Assyria, Sennacherib, came and laid siege to Jerusalem. And he almost destroyed the city of Jerusalem. He destroyed all the other fortified cities of uh, the kingdom of Judah. This one, this was in 701 uh, BC, 701 BC. And this was a serious crisis moment for the people of Judah and of course for the king Hezekiah. It was a privilege of mine and some friends some time ago to uh, participate in an excavation, uh, uh, archaeological excavation, uh, you know, event, digging up the city of Lachish. Lachish was the second capital of Judah. After Jerusalem, Jude, uh, Lachish was the second capital. And so, you know, it was quite interesting. And we were digging down to the layer that um, corresponded to the time of 701 BC, when the king, uh, King Sennacherib, laid siege uh, to Jerusalem. And some of the things that we actually unearthed and touched coming from the time of uh, the prophet Isaiah and King Hezekiah and so on, the Uh, so it was quite interesting, you know, touching some of those uh, objects and artifacts from back then, like the arrowheads, you know, arrowheads and uh, sling balls, you know, the balls that were put in slings when people, like when David was fighting with Goliath, he was he used a sling and you would need a sling ball, the stone that he puts in there. I used to think it's like uh, the small stones that we used to put in catapults in rural Zimbabwe when they're shooting down birds. But um, sling balls are basically like the size of an, a, a, you know, a full grown apple. Uh, it, so this, it was quite interesting. And one of the, of course, the siege ramp that was used by King Sennacherib to take down the city of Lakish is still there even today as I speak to you. Um, also, we unearthed the remains, skeletal remains of uh, a, a, a child who could have been about uh, three or four years old, buried right in front of the of the of the of the uh, their house, you know, of the house. And Jews ordinarily would not bury people inside the city, so that burial would show that something must have been happening outside the city so that they could not go out to bury. And that's why the burial had to take place inside uh, the city and right in front of the house. Probably this child was one of those who succumbed to hunger uh, and so on, but children would you know, ordinarily succumb first before the adults and so on and so on. I mean, quite interesting. It ceases to be just a story in the Bible when you begin to unearth uh, stuff right out of the ground and the stones begin to uh, talk to us. But anyways, 
uh, the main point that I want to get to. So this was the setting of, uh, you know, and then in chapter 38, Hezekiah gets sick. In chapter 36, 37, God delivers uh, the uh, Hezekiah from this huge threat. He delivers Jerusalem from this huge threat uh, of uh, King Sennacherib. In chapter 38, Hezekiah gets so sick that he, he almost dies. But then God says to him, okay, after you prayed, I'll give you another 15 more years. And this is news that went far and wide, particularly the deliverance from Sennacherib and his recovery from sickness. Because Assyria was at that time the superpower. It was the superpower. So can you imagine a country like the United States maybe being conquered or being overcome by Lesotho or Swaziland, something like that. It was a big mismatch. It was like a David and Goliath affair all over again, but uh, on a national and a regional scale this time. So this is news that went far and wide. And uh, some of the people who hated the Assyrians with a passion were the Babylonians. At that time, Babylon was really struggling under the uh, oppression and the... Uh, you know, the yoke of, of Assyria. And they were trying all they could to break free from this yoke uh, of colonialism by the Assyrians. So the Babylonians were really trying. And the Bible tells us then in chapter 39, Isaiah 39, verse 1. At that time, Maduk Baladan, son of Baladan, king of Babylon, sent Hezekiah letters and a gift because he had heard of his illness and recovery, Hezekiah received uh, the envoys gladly and showed them whatever was in his storehouse, the silver, the gold, the spices, the fine oil, his entire armory, and everything of, uh, found among his treasures. There was nothing in his palace or in all his kingdom that Hezekiah did not show them. Then Isaiah the prophet went to King Hezekiah and asked, what did those men say and where did they come from? From a distant land, Hezekiah replied, they came to me from Babylon. Can you believe it? You know, he was a flattered. He was so excited. The prophet asked, what did they see in your palace? The, uh, they saw everything in my palace, Hezekiah said. There's nothing among my treasures that I did not show them. So Hezekiah was so excited about this and um, you know the at this time the there was a leader in babylon called baladan so he sent his son maduk baladan so uh baladan was a revolutionary fighter he was a freedom fighter for the independence and deliver deliverance of babylon so when he heard about what had happened to the assyrians to the assyrian army at jerusalem and the sickness and recovery of um, Hezekiah, he thought to himself that I think I can have a powerful ally in my war against Assyria if I take Hezekiah to my side. And so he sent his own son, that is high respect, sent his own son over to Hezekiah. Hezekiah was, you know, flattered to be recognized by such a powerful nation as Babylon to be recognized as a potential uh, you know, ally. And so he said, well, I mean, I can show you everything. I, I, I will be, it will be a good move if you make me uh, your ally. And so he showed what he had uh, to offer if they were to get into this relationship, into this alliance. And so he says, uh, all this... ...worthy uh, of uh, the recognition the recognition and honor that um, the king of Babylon had bestowed on him by recognizing him and sending these special messengers. And after all this was done, and those uh, envoys from Babylon had left uh, Judah, God immediately sent the prophet Isaiah uh, to Hezekiah and he said to him, I mean, I hear you had some visitors here who came on a state visit. Who were those people? And Hezekiah said, oh, you won't believe this if I tell you, you know, those guys were from Babylon. Can you believe it? That Baladan, the king of Babylon, recognizes little Judah as a potential ally in their war or in our war as a region against Assyria. And so 
I was so excited, you know, to get this. And this guy said, okay, uh, what did they see in your house? I said, I showed them everything, everything, man of God. There's nothing in my house that I didn't show them. We started, in fact, I gave them a guided tour personally. I gave them a guided tour throughout and I showed them everything all the way to the reserve bank or to the central bank and so on. And so in the armory and all security departments, everything I showed them. And uh, this is what then uh, Isaiah says, the, verse uh, five, this is Isaiah 39. Then Isaiah said to Hezekiah, hear the word of the Lord Almighty. The time will surely come when everything in your palace and all that your predecessors have stored up until this day will be carried off to Babylon. Nothing will be left, says the Lord. And some of your descendants, your own flesh and blood, will be born, who will be born to you, will be taken away. And they will become eunuchs in the palace of the king of Babylon. The word of the Lord you have spoken is good. Hezekiah replied, for he thought there will be peace and security in my time. Now, do you hear what's happening here? God says through Hezekiah, I mean, through Isaiah to Hezekiah, all this, all this stuff that you've showed to the Babylonians will be taken to Babylon, including your own family, your own grandchildren. They will be taken to Babylon and as prisoners. And uh, Hezekiah was worried, almost like panicked. Said, I mean, when is this going to happen? Says, well, it's not going to happen in your time, but after you, this will happen. And Hezekiah said, oh, what a relief. I thought this was going to happen in my time. If it doesn't happen in my time, oh, that's okay. I, I don't have any problem with that. The Bible actually says um, the word, uh, you know, the word of the Lord which you have spoken is good. At least there will be peace in and truth in my days. So Hezekiah is not bothered about what's going to happen to his descendants. He's, he's happy for uh, if this all this trouble is going to come to the subsequent generations. And he says, if it's not going to happen in my time, it's okay. That the word is good. I want to say, brothers and sisters, what this is a terrible attitude by King Hezekiah. He, he was only concerned about his time, his own immediate circumstances. He didn't care for what was going to happen to the uh, children and the grandchildren, great-grandchildren. Those were going to come after him. He was only concerned about his own time. And this kind of mentality, I find it unbelievable. But this is not unique to Hezekiah. I want to argue this morning and suggest to us that this is a prevalent attitude even among us in Africa, that we are okay to find allies with all these companies that we're working for and to show everything that we're capable of, all our qualifications, all our capabilities, we show and to prove ourselves worthy employees to these companies and great stuff happens. We get all these promotions, company houses and cars and everything like that, go on business trips, wonderful, fine, in your time. But what's going to happen to your children and your children's children after you? What's going to happen? We are just happy to be CEO, to be in this position and that position. But what's going to, are your children going to inherit your certificates? Are they going to inherit your position as HR for this big company, as you know, HR director for this big company? Are they going to inherit that? What are they going to get? And I want to say to us, it's high time we woke up as Africans. Some of you running powerful business entities, your, your own as I mean entrepreneurs and business persons. And that's commendable. But one of the things our children, sometimes our wives are to those who are men, wives and children have no clue where money that supports the family comes from or how it is made. They have no idea. And so there is a poor and terrible succession plan. And so many of the great initiatives that we come up with, they perish with the founders. They perish with us. They are not passed on to the next generation. And this is one of the greatest differences between uh, most of the people on our continent and the peoples from other parts of the world. They are able to document 
their procedures, their methods, everything. And they rope, better still, they rope in their children to start working on those things. You know, for us, we wait until our child has gone to university, graduated, then they apply uh, for a job. You look at our Indian friends. They put their house right on top of the shop and the kids are part of the operations of the day-to-day -day running of the business. They care about that. They are concerned about that. You know, these kids, they are just in elementary school, but they are the ones already running right there on the till and everything like that. But for what about your children? You wait until they come from UNISA or you wait until they come from, uh, you know, uh, uh, VITS and then you say, okay, now they apply and they apply to this little one who's just in secondary school. And, you know, I mean, okay, do you get what I'm saying? I'm saying we, we need to look into what, what we are doing. Is it sustainable? We need, you know, the Jews and the concept that if you don't teach your child a practical skill that can sustain them, you have taught them to be a thief. That was their belief. If you don't teach your children something that can sustain them practically, you have taught them to be a thief. Congratulations, you have been successful. They are graduating from your class, your school, which teaches to be a thief, and they've passed excellently. You, you, you know, you're pro we produce misery and poverty, and we perpetuate it. And we perpetuate it. Let, I mean, we need, we look at Paul. Paul was a PhD holder, Paul in the Bible. But what sustained him was tent making. You know, Jesus was a carpenter. It was practical skills that were taught. You know, an Adventist education, when it started, it meant to teach practical skills. Something happened to that blueprint. And it always baffles my mind. That, for example, in a country such as Zimbabwe, the church has been around here from since uh, 1894, and we have got so many schools in this country, at church schools. But you know, we never send as a church in Zimbabwe. I'm telling you, as an example, we never send people to do their uh, higher studies in, in education, like PhD, masters. As a church, we have no business. We only send one line people to do theology. You know, all these are the guys. It, it, we take people from schools who are trained by the government and other churches. Those are the ones who become heads of our schools. They don't have that very philosophy of education. And so we are not, these places were supposed to be industrial bases, like what uh, is with the case with Avondale in Australia. You know, I've been in some of those factories at Avondale, uh, you know, that belong to Sanitarium, one of the largest breakfast cereal manufacturers in Australia. And Australia is not a small place. Australia is a massive country, as some of you would know. I mean, we were meant to be the head and never the tail. But how do we become the head if we have an attitude such as Hezekiah's? We don't care what's going to happen to the next generation. Is that normal? You know what we are, are like? It's, we are like someone who buys a, a lot, you know, a stand or a, a, to, to, to build a house. Then you start, you, you, you spend so much money buying that. You build all up to the window level and then you're not able to continue. You're in retirement and so on. Your children come, instead of finishing that house, they also buy another lot and they start, they go up to roof level. Then they, and so we end up with, we are always digging foundations. And, you know, our children, they are always, it's like we launch them out to fend for themselves and find their own feet and so on and so on. At least there should be a base. It's not a shameful thing for us to start in such a way that we leave our, we rope in our children so that they learn the, the, the ropes with our guidance and so on. Look at our Indian friends. When those, are, you know, the one uh, grandpa Patel, he, he's still there somewhere in the corner in that shop. And now it's his son. And his sons or his daughter's children and you know the, the grandchildren, they are doing the thing. You will never match those people because they have a certificate from VITS. You will not match them. This is generational wealth. We should have a different attitude. These Babylonians that you are so excited about and so on and so on. You, I mean, <laughs> we are not going anywhere. I, I'm not here to insult anybody, but I'm here really to challenge our thinking.
Some of the, how much do your children, for those who are privileged to have children, how much do they know about what you do? What practically do they, have they learned from you? What would they, how, if you were to die today as, a, as their mother or father, what would they remain with? Your certificates. What are they going to remain with? You know, that can sustain them practically. May God help us and may God have mercy on us. You know, in ancient Africa, in pre-colonial Africa, people had particular trades. Some people used to make yokes for oxen. Some people used to make drums, you know, uh, drums that you use when you're singing and playing music. They, it was known that in that family, they make drums. In that family, they make this and that. And those were like industries and they used to supply and sustain the economy uh, and so on and so on. But today, it's just like, I don't know, we, we, we are in a, a space and yet the people that you are working for, many of the companies around the world, and even some of these multinationals, they are family uh, businesses, they are family uh, you know, entities and companies. Many of these hotel chains, they belong to families. And so we, we, we support all other families except our own. Except your own, you work and you, you're like, yes, Akaias, you're so excited that you've been hired by this big company. But as a family company, what's happening to your own family? I, I, I may God help us to have a different mindset. You know, uh, the book of Proverbs says that a crown does not endure to all generations. The promotion that you're enjoying, the perks that you're enjoying, your children may not have any share in those after you are gone. And so we need to have something that is generational and that grows and develops and grows. Let's stop hating our own selves and families. Let's start embracing ourselves. You know, one of the things that we have, generally speaking, is when somebody starts a business entity, the first thing is to make sure no relative is near. And so you do all this with strangers. Some of those, they eventually take over the company. Your family has no clue what's happening and everything like that. Uh, you know, so on and so on. Some of us, I, I'm saying, I'm not saying it's bad to work for other people, but I'm saying, as you do that, look for something that is practical that your children can learn and that can sustain them even after you're gone. They are not going to inherit your degrees. They will not, they will not benefit them in any way. Your graduation gowns will not help any of your children. You see, uh, what I'm saying is there needs to be something practical. And for those of you who have got business operations and entities, please make sure your children are involved right from early on. I know some people say, oh, my children are not even interested and so on. Uh, sometimes we wait and I mean, let's may pray about it and find a way. What you are doing is not sustainable. We are creating wealth and then it perishes with us. Then our children have to start from scratch. They get up to somewhere, then it dies with them. And then, so, you know, sometimes we do it even in the church. We have this administration. They come up with the brilliant uh, ideas to take the conference forward, the union or whatever. And then they are uh, voted out of office. Another administration comes in. They are not interested in what the previous administration was talking about. Even though those were great ideas, so this new administration needs to start afresh so that they have something new to report to the constituents, their own initiative. And so they won't finish on the previous administration's initiatives. We are doing this in so many places, even in governments. That's why we are, we are where we are as the continent with all the resources that we have. We are going nowhere very fast, even as families, because the one generation is not helping the other generation. We need for the next generation to stand on our shoulders so they can see further than we saw as a generation. But they are always standing on the ground. And yet in other parts of the world, people are standing, uh, climbing higher and higher. And you know, now they're thinking of colonizing Mars when we are still fighting potholes in our countries. Some are thinking, you know, colonizing Mars it's because they are building on the success of previous generations. This toxic attitude of Hezekiah is something that we should pray for. And they repent in Jesus' name so that we are able to build a platform that benefits subsequent generations. A wise person leaves an inheritance for their children. What is it that you are going to leave 
as a mother, as a father, as uh, an uncle, as an aunt or whatever. What are you going to leave for your children? Do you have as a chaos attitude that as long as I'm CEO, as long as I'm manager during my time, what will happen to my kids? Well, they will see, they will sort that for themselves. What a toxic attitude for an otherwise a very good king. Hezekiah was not a bad king. He was a very good king. We are not bad people here, very good people, but we can have a toxic attitude that the Bible says a wise person leaves an inheritance for his children, for her children. May God help us to have that kind of attitude so that greater things are achieved even after our time. Someone said that um, a society begins to grow the moment adults begin to plant trees whose shadow they know they will never sit under. Then that society begins to grow. The moment we grow trees, we know we are never going to eat fruits from this tree, but it's for the benefit of the next generation. But here we are sometimes busy chopping the few trees which are already there, instead of planting new ones, chopping the ones that are already there, you know, and sabotaging the subsequent generations. We don't go anywhere like that. We need a mindset shift and think, look yourself in the mirror and be honest. What is it that your children and those who come after them will benefit from you? What is it? Is it your, your position in your company or uh, where you're working or whatever? Is it that? Some of these things will be even repossessed by banks, you know, and so on and so on. We need this kind of mindset. May God help us. May God bless us. Whatever it means to anybody here, I just pray that God be with us. Let us close our eyes and pray. Our kind and most gracious Heavenly Father, may glory and honor come to you, for only you are worthy to be praised. I just pray that, Lord, you may speak to us individually in our circumstances, so that we are able to benefit those who come after us. May your name be praised. May your name be glorified. I pray for those who are employed. I pray for those who are employers here. But may this family be central. And Lord, may you help us to get to read of the I don't care attitude of Hezekiah, the toxic attitude which doesn't care about the next generation. May you help us to be, to be thoughtful, to be uh, strategic in our thinking and in our actions. In the name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior, we pray now and forevermore. Amen.